Hello. I'm here. You're here. All of those people are here. <clears throat> Everybody that matters is right here, right now. Just being here now as hard as they can. And I appreciate it. Anyway, hi. I'm Tad. Um, God, it's been a horrible last couple of weeks. Not so much for me personally. I am much better. Health-wise, um, for all the reasons I told you about last week, that all seems to be going well. I feel much more like my normal self. I can bend over and walk and, you know, do things like that. It's all good. Um, you know, I'm just like a normal old person now instead of what I was, which was something altogether different and very unfamiliar to me. But as I said, it's been a really crappy couple of weeks in a lot of other ways. Um, I, again, this that's not the purpose of this particular um, evening, morning affair um, to talk about politics and the news and stuff like that as, as uh, upsetting as it is sometimes and as very much deserving of comment. But I do comment, obviously, um, on things on my um, my, you know, uh, social media pages and things like that. So if anybody wants to know what I think about things, they can certainly find that out. But as I said, I try to keep this a controversy free zone just because it's got a different purpose. Um, I can't promise that will always be true with all my broadcasts because as I said, after finishing other land, um, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next and how I'm going to do it and et cetera, et cetera. Um, which, by the way, um, I very much would like all of you out there to be part of and to let me know what you would like to see or hear or not see or not hear. <laughs> like, go away, Dad. Go away. Leave us alone. You know, that's that's acceptable also. But um, I will ask you, you know, and I have in the past and some very nice uh, suggestions have come in. So don't think I ignored those or I've forgotten about those. Um, but at that point in time, I hadn't decided to start reading other land, which has now taken quite a few months. I have no idea exactly how long. Anyway, so I will avoid talking about all the things that are depressing me at the moment. Um, and to assure you that I personally am fine, my Deborah, uh, Deborah Beal, my wonderful and, uh, extremely, um, Clever wife is doing fine and kids are fine. Um, dogs and cat and snake, as far as I know, although, as I've said in the past, what exactly goes on with the snake is a bit of a mystery because um, the two of our young people whose snake it is are, um, well, A, they're, they do all the snake care, unlike dog and cat care, which in part falls to me in large part. Um, and uh, they also, you know, the snake herself is not the most social, not the most gregarious creature I've ever come across. Certainly she does not, she's not a patch on our um, bearded dragon who was, you know, Mr. Party. Loved to get out, ride around on people's shoulders, meet people, you know, stuff like that. He was, he was a true party reptile. Um, whereas Irwin's snake is much more reclusive. Irwin's more like me, <laughs> you know, in the sense of like, I'll just stay home. In fact, I've got a room here, a little hiding place, and I'll just stay in it. So I respect that. You know, this is not a complaint. I'm not expecting Irwin to get out and boogie down with the rest of us all the time. Anyway, so what else was I going to talk about? As I mentioned, there's really not a huge amount going on at the moment. I'm working. I literally am literally working. Um, I've gotten past a lot of the, the refurbishment and realignment and editing phase of getting back into Navigator's Children, um, which again is the final part of the books I'm working on now. And um, I'm uh, actually writing new material now, you know, going forward from the place where I stopped, which was, you know, like 100 pages from the ending. Um, so I'm actually making actual progress, which believe me, I can only speak for myself. Some of you are undoubtedly writers yourselves. Others are 
you know, familiar with other writers. So I'm only speaking for me here, but no matter how much work I do in terms of editing or um, copy editing or proofreading or anything like that, or even just the thinking part, which is absolutely vital to doing um, what I do. You know, I have to spend a certain amount of time just thinking, doing thought experiments, trying out different possibilities, thinking about, you know, but what does that underline a theme that I want to underline or is that just going to kind of hang there and do nothing useful and all that kind of stuff. But I never feel like I've really worked unless I actually have added new pages to a manuscript. And it's a ridiculous thing. Whoops. It's a ridiculous thing to feel like. I just fell off. <laughs> My dead Fred just fell off, just leaped. You're already dead, Fred. Um, dead Fred was given to me by one of our online friends. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm very happy to be back in the phase of actually making new pages. Um, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about it that feels like, yes, this is actual work because I can count it at the end of the day. I can say, oh, I did five pages. I did seven pages. I did nine pages, whatever. And it feels like, okay, I'm done. I can, I can, you know, lift the burden from my shoulders and put it down until I go back to it tomorrow. Whereas even if I spend eight or 10 hours doing other things, including, you know, all the stuff that is just part of life that has to be done, you know, household stuff and repairs and cleaning and management of the, the, the house and everything that goes with it and family life and all that. I realize those are all just as important. I do. I do understand that. Um, but it never feels to me like, okay, now I can rest. <laughs> now I can take some hours off with a clean conscience. Um, whereas when I've written six or seven decent pages, I always feel like, whew, man, I earned that. So just a weirdness. Anyway, let me check in here um, before I go back to reading. And then, well, actually, let me have a quick conversation about the reading part first. Um, I don't, I suspect that I am going to fairly easily plow through the rest of Otherland tonight because there's only about 16 pages. So I think that will be fairly equitable. So for the small subset of this group out there, um, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow night. I will probably, I could, I could either read the same section again for, you know, or I'll try to find something else to read. Although I'm don't have much that's of the right length. I've read almost all my short stories. So while I'm, I'll think about that. I'll figure out something, but, um, I do want to warn you that, and I probably, unless people have questions, which they're always welcome to put in the chat bar, um, unless people have specific questions or something, um, I probably won't go on much beyond the point where I finish, um, just to let you know, because I figure you all hear enough of me going jibba, 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 um, as it is without me just filling space. I did used to be a DJ at one point. And I uh, used to have to fill space sometimes. And I'm pretty good at it, but that doesn't actually make it interesting. So um, I, I would rather have some kind of a plan going in instead of just sitting there going, hmm, 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 Pelagian. Pelagian means uh, ocean. But because of that, it also uh, is a certain kind of heresy named after Pelagius, who was an Irish philosopher and religious figure um, whose name probably was originally Morgan, meaning of the sea. And because of that, it was turned into a Greek uh, Greek name of Pelagius. Blah, blah. You know, I mean, I, I can do that kind of crap for hours, but really, you know, we all have better things to do with our time, <laughs> I think. Anyway, um, so with all of that in mind, if any of that made any sense, um, I'm going to check in and see who is in the chat bar and who has checked in. And first off the bat is my friend Olaf. Hello, Olaf. Good to see you. And Ronnie. Hello. Good morning. Nice to see you too. Mark, checking in from Yorkshire. Hello. Good morning. Debbie. And Debbie's been awake since 4 a.m. and has already made shortbread and done the ironing. Well, it just makes me want to go to bed right now, Debbie, because I didn't do anything like that worthwhile and useful all day today. And it's now 1.11 in the morning, my time. So 
I hope you're happy. No, nah, just kidding. Good for you. Sharp bread is lovely. Kristen, hello. Good to see you. Um, Boris, hey, buddy. Um, the defocus background on your camera. Well, I probably can, but I've never worried about it. I, I'm I'm not a professional. This is my friend Boris, who is, among other things, a professional videographer and uh, video director. So he knows about all that stuff. But I, I'm letting people into my downstairs. Um, you know, I'm I'm letting people into my office, as god awful messy as it is, um, and. You know, I figure it's important to keep it in focus so people can really see the nitty gritty of the author's life. I, I never figured out where the part is about defocusing the background. <laughs> I'll have a look on it. We'll give it a try just to see because, hey, if my professionally expertise kind of friend, not kind of, my both friend and professionally expertise um, tells me, then I'll have to at least give it a try and see how it looks. Iris, good morning. Good morning. Good morning to you. Ilva, hello, sweetie. I am sorry to hear that you're depressed from isolation. It is really wretched. Uh, believe me, I know when I was just, you know, the couple of times in the last few years, I've gone through extended health stretches. It, it is miserable just kind of being isolated. And at a certain point, you just feel like, Oh God, why even bother? There's nothing to do. There's a, you know, I'll watch more TV, read more books. Blah. So anyway, I sympathize and, but I, I'm glad you're a little better. Um, and I hope that continues rapidly forward. Petra, good morning and hello to you back from two weeks holiday in France. How nice. Um, I haven't been in France for quite a few years and uh, would love to get back there before too long. Um, I actually sp speak some French and uh, it's always a fun thing to do is to go to a country that you like and speak the language there with the people who live there. Um, ba -ba -bum -bum, who else is here? Wouter. Wouter is checking in from the Netherlands where it is chilly. I hope and hopes we're all doing well. As I said, doing well here, Deb and I actually got out. We decided, you know, what the heck? We haven't like left the house or I, at least I hadn't and she hasn't left it much in over a week. So we actually went out to dinner tonight, just had a dinner, just the two of us. It was quite nice. And then we came back and we watched the most recent version of Little Women, which was written and directed or adapted. And the script was adapted, obviously, from the famous book by Louisa May Alcott. But it was written and directed by Greta Gerwig, who is also a very fine actress. And it was a really good production, really good filmed version of Little Women. So that was a really nice evening that we had. So I'm not complaining, even though I'm not in fancy places like France or whatever. Um, anyway, so doing well. And thanks for checking in. Olaf is checking in with somebody else. Jessica or Jessica. Hello. Good morning, Jessica. And okay, there's so we've had both Petra. Hello, Petra. We've had both Petra and Christine of the Spirer sisters check in. The Schwesterin. Schwesterin? I can't remember now. My German is much poorer than my Spanish and French because I learned what little bit I learned much later. Renee, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Cliff, good to see you. Hope you and the family are well. Jeremy. Um, my look of intense concentration on my face at the beginning of the live stream. A look of intense concentration on my face at the beginning of the live stream is, um, it's usually because I'm trying to post the URL on different things. And of course, at any given time, everything on Facebook or Twitter is usually changed around in some way. Or my desk equipment has changed or whatever. So, you know, or I'm plugged into different things. And so I'm always kind of going like, okay, now what? Um, mm, uh, mm. And I've just barely learned how to keep my mouth closed. So I'm not standing on while I'm looking at things. Um, but it ain't easy. Let me tell you, I'm a mouth breather from way back. I literally. Um, anyway, so good to see you, Jeremy. And Kristen is pointing out that I'm crazy for doing this for two years. Yeah, clearly, clearly, obviously. Um, but on the other hand, you know, after a really crappy last couple of weeks in, in the news and stuff like that, I mean, it's 
nice to have something to look forward to on the weekend where you're actually going to be hanging out in a nice, fun, friendly way with people that you like, which is, by the way, one of the reasons that I try to keep these things largely controversy free. I don't want in this particular arena, I don't really want to get into things where they're going to be divisive because it is what it is. It's me reading and I want people just to be able to, if they want to be read too, I want them to come and do that with me um, and not have to be like, oh, is he going to say something that pisses me off? Because that's, that's how it is for me. You know, I mean, sometimes I will be fine. And then somebody says something and that's like, oh, my hackles go up and I'm just not going to enjoy it as much after that. Um, cancel that. Go away. Uh, I have a new computer and it's got all these weird little things that keep popping up telling me, oh, you have to sign in with your Apple ID or whatever. And, you know, I'm like, leave me alone. I don't have to sign in with my Apple ID. You're just getting in my way for no good reason whatsoever, as it's doing right now. So I'm going to have to look around that little thing that's showing up in the middle of the screen. Um, and I will do so. Go away. Anyway, anybody else I haven't said hello to yet? Yes, a few people. Debbie? Okay. Shirt of the Week is boring. Shirt of the Week is a dark green. Oh, it's a very nice color green. It's a dark green t-shirt. Um, because that's what I wore out with Deb tonight. Was a uh, black suit coat and a dark green t-shirt. So I'm afraid it's not very photogenic. And it's certainly not as flashy as some of the other things that I occasionally put on. Um, who else have we got? We've got, I think I said hello to Jessica already. Yes, I did. Jessica. Jessica. James. Hello, hello. And, oh, and James is making bibimbap, um, which I know something about, but I certainly don't know how to make it. So congratulations to you for making it. It sounds very cool. Um, Holger, hello from the Baltic Sea. And... Absolutely. You go and be with your beloved and you guys have a good time um, celebrating your anniversary. And you can always see this on YouTube or whatever. So, or, you know, the social media, other social media. Anamika, hello, hello. So Anamika is going to check in on the video also. So that's fine. It's all good. That's why we record them. Who else have we got here? Anybody I haven't said hello to yet? Now they're all just having conversations with each other, which is fine. I, I, I'm in favor of it, but it, it makes it complicated when I'm trying to find people to say hello to. Spring. Spring. Oh, what a great, what a great name. Um, anyway, so hello. Good to have you with us. Um, who else here? Renee? Yes, I think I already said hello to Renee, but if I didn't, Deborah commented on your flower garden and made you feel super special. Well, that is definitely a point of contact between you and Deb because Deb surprised herself by becoming a gardener in her later adult life and is very, very involved with gardening at our house and the property and all that kind of stuff. So that is definitely a connection. Um, 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 who else have we got here who I haven't said hello to yet? I think that's everybody. Hello, hello, hello. And spring, that's a great name. I can't, is, are you saying that, that Facebook doesn't like your using your name because it confuses things or something? Anyway, very sorry to hear that. If so, I would much rather be named Spring than Tad. I've told you in the past, most of you folks out there, that I'm slightly dubious about my name. It, it was a nickname when I was very young. Um, so that was really the only name I ever knew I had. I've never been my given name, which is Robert. Um, I've explained all this before, so you don't need to hear it. But that's basically it. And I'm always kind of ambivalent. Um, so uh, about about the name Tad, because as again, as I've explained before, in my culture growing up, Tad was usually a name short for Thaddeus or something. It was also seen as what we would call in America a preppy name. Preppy means people who have money, people whose kids grow up, you know, going to private schools, as we call them here in America, public schools, as they call them in the UK. Um, which never made sense to me. And uh, 
you know, people who have sailboats and, you know, and they're always called Bryce or Tad or, you know, oh, come down, lovey. We're having a wonderful time. Tad's here and Bryce and Stephanie and oh my God, we're having such a good time. And um, I've never been one of those old money type of people, not in the least. Um, my parents, regular old working class folk, um, although they've, you know, went out and got college degrees and all that stuff and made a nice life for themselves. Um, but it never quite felt like, like a name that fit me. But when I started writing, I briefly, I, again, if I've told you this before, I apologize. After a couple of years, it's hard to remember. But um, when I started writing, I briefly considered like using another name or using some variant on my given name, like R. Paul Williams or one of those kinds of things. Um, and then eventually I decided, you know, it would be nice someday if people that I knew from, you know, the children's theater or high school or whatever, little league playing, played baseball with, if they, it's not that common a name. The tad part is, isn't, isn't anyway. And, you know, it's like, I'm, I'd want people to recognize it and go, oh, I wonder if that's Tad who I used to, you know, see in school or, you know, who I used to hang out with in the parking lot and smoke or, you know, whatever. So that's why. Okay. It's a lot of jibber jabber, a lot of jibber jabber, jibber jabber. So I am going to start reading. So what we read last week was in general was a long meeting of Jean Glure and the rest of the Grail Project people. And there was kind of a coup attempt by um, Robert Wells and General Yakubian, who are kind of uneasy allies. Um, and uh, they were talking, they, they kind of sprung this thing on, um, on Jean Glure that, that they had discovered that the, the the escaped subject, who none of them know who it is, but they know that a subject escaped um, that Jean Glure had placed in the system. And it was a you know real person. Um, they had tracked it to you know some order that had come from Jean Glure himself. So they were making a big deal out of this kind of vote of no confidence thing, et cetera, et cetera. The readers know or should know by this point that, of course, that person was Paul Jonas and that he was sprung from the system by Mr. Sellers. Um, but Jean Gleur was able to prove that it was manipulated through Yakubian in the military. And only then did it get um, to uh, then only then did it use codes that came from Jean Gleur himself. So with that, um, Jean Gleur basically beat back this coup attempt and uh, is, was triumphant. And so now we're going back to Rini and Kabu and Orlando and Fredericks and the rest who are escaping from the palace. Again, we are also within virtual other land now in the Atasco's Temelin sim simulation. And they're escaping from the simulation and trying to um, get away because the Atascos themselves have just been killed and uh, in real life, which we know also know as readers, is part of a um, kind of a commando operation by Dread. So that's where we are. The docks were only a short distance from the broad front steps of the palace, perhaps less than half a mile, judging by the rigging lights that glimmered between the buildings. Orlando and his new allies did their best to form a coherent group before setting off on foot. This scans utterly, Orlando fumed. This is a VR simulation, the most powerful one anyone's ever heard of, and we're going to walk? But any loopholes for instantaneous travel or other useful reality molding tricks that might be built into the structure of Temeloon were lost to Orlando and his new allies. If we only had one of the Atascos with us, they marched as quickly as they could, just beneath the threshold at which their anxious haste would be obvious. The city was busy at this early evening hour, the streets full of traffic, motorized and pedal driven, the stone sidewalks crowded with Temeluni citizens on their way home from work. But even in this crush of pseudo humanity, the band of travelers attracted attention. It wasn't that surprising, Orlando decided, 
There were few cities, virtual or otherwise, where someone as flamboyantly outrageous as Sweet William would not at least briefly draw the eye. Tall Reeny fell in beside him again. Do you think Sarah's meant that as soon as we get on the water, we'd cross over into another simulation? Or are we going to have to sail for days? Forlando shook his head. I can't even guess. What's to keep them from catching us on the river? Fredericks asked, leaning in at Orlando's shoulder. I mean, they're not going to leave that throne room alone forever, and when they go looking... He stopped, his eyes widening. Fen Fen! For that matter, what happens if we get killed here? You drop offline, Greeny began, then paused. The baboon, loping along beside her on all fours, looked up. You are thinking that if we go offline now, there is no guarantee that dying a virtual death will change that, he asked. Or are you considering something worse? She shook her head violently. It's just not possible. It can't be. Pain is one thing. That could be just hypnotic suggestion. Even induced comas, I would be believe. But I really don't want to believe that Something happening to you in VR could kill you. She stopped again. No, she said firmly, as if putting something in a drawer and shutting it. We'll have time to talk about everything later. None of this is useful now. They hurried on in silence. Since the tall downtown buildings were now blocking the view of the water, Fred Fredericks ran ahead to scout. Surfing along on the surreality of the moment, Orlando found that he was staring at Rini's baboon friend. What's your name? He asked the simulated monkey. Abu. There was a click and then a swallowing sound at the beginning. Orlando couldn't tell whether the first letter was supposed to be a G, an H, or a K. And you are Orlando. The look on his face might have been a baboon smile. Orlando nodded. He was sure the person behind the monkey had an interesting story to tell, but he didn't have the strength to wonder about it very much. Later, as Rini had said, later there would be time to talk. If there is a later. Fredericks was hurrying back toward them. It's just around the corner, he said. The boat's all lit up. What if it's not ready to go, Orlando? It's ready to go, he said curtly. He had no idea, but he was damned if he was going to give these people anything else to worry about. I saw it when they were bringing us in. Fredericks gave him a doubtful look, but kept silent. She's seen, she's seen, man, muttered the robot sim dolefully, fingering his own anodized neck in search of his can. They're gonna catch us, do some harm. This dire man, this far dire. The barge was moored at its own dock, a single bright flower of pomp and colorful decoration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Amid the brutal functionalism of the working side of the harbor. Looking at the graceful ship, Orlando felt the weakness in his limbs recede a little, the dull pain in his head abate. The barge would take them away, where their enemies couldn't find them. There would be time to rest to recover his strength. Rini was looking back over Orlando's shoulder, her finger wagging in the air as though she were conducting a very small orchestra. What are you doing? Fredericks asked. Counting? There are nine of us. Is that right? Or were there more when we left the palace? Fredericks shook his head. I don't know. I, I didn't think about it. We should have. Rini was clearly angry, but it seemed to be at herself. We may have lost people along the way. Can't worry about it, Orlando said flatly. Let's just hope there's someone on board who knows how to make the thing go. As if in answer, a group of figures began gathering at the top of the ramp that led onto the barge from the dockside stairs. As Rini gathered the travelers at the ramp's base, two of the figures on the ship detached themselves from the rest and came down the gangway toward them. One of them looked like a reasonably high muckamuck, his cape thatched in silver fish scales. 
Orlando wondered for a moment if he were the captain, but decided that no one could spend a life at sea and have such unweathered skin. The other man, a non-com, in a small plain cape, who was clearly the Temeluni Navy's equivalent of a bone breaker, had another of those large and unpleasant stone axes in his belt and some kind of pearl-handled pistol sheathed on the other hip. Rini held up the ring. We have been sent by the God King. He gave us this and commanded that you take us where we want to go. The official leaned forward to inspect the ring while keeping his hands respectfully at his side. It certainly looks like the signet of he who is favored above all others. And who, may I ask, are you? We are, are a delegation from, Rini hesitated, the Banana Republic said Orlando hastily, sent to request a boon from he who is favored above all others. He looked up. At the top of the gangway, the dozen waiting sailors were managing simultaneously to stand at rigid attention and to watch the proceedings with interest. Now we are being sent back with a message for our masters. The, but the official shook his head as though it were all too much for him. Still, it is very strange we have not been warned. The God King, I, I mean he who is favored above all others, only made the decision a sh very short while ago, Rini began. Of course, the official bowed. I will contact the palace to receive my clearance. Please forgive me. I cannot allow you on board until that has been done. I apologize deeply and abjectly for the inconvenience. Rini looked helplessly down at Kabu and then to Orlando. Orlando shrugged, fighting a great and depressing weariness. He had half known something like this would happen, that he could not wear the Thargor Sim without inheriting certain responsibilities. He leaned a little closer toward the bone breaker. The pistol was on the man's other hip, out of reach. Regretfully, Orlando curled his fingers around the stone axe and snatched it out of the belt, even as he shouldered the startled non-com off the gangplank. Grab him, he said, shoving the official toward Rini and the others. The sailors at the top of the gangway, bellowing in surprise, had drawn their own sidearms. Orlando was gambling that they would not shoot for fear of harming this obviously important man. However, he couldn't afford to let them start thinking about alternative methods of capture. Follow me, he called, already springing up the ramp. What are you doing? Frederick shouted. Orlando didn't answer. If there was anything he knew about, it was virtual combat, and his own personal lesson was avoid unnecessary chit-chat. Now, he just had to pray that some of the Thargor Sims' designated strength and speed remained, despite his own illness and the strictures of an unfamiliar system. Help him! Fredericks was shouting down below. They'll kill him! Orlando leaped from the top end of the gangway and hit the deck rolling, upending the first two sailors. He brought the axe around in a swift arc and felt the sickening give of blade on bone as he shattered another sailor's kneecap, but he could already feel stickiness in his own usually fluid reflexes. The three bodies writhing on the deck around him gave him a moment's desperately needed cover. What little strength he had, and it was less than he was used to in this sim, was draining fast. Already his breath was stinging in his lungs. As he got to his knees, someone jumped onto his back, bearing him down so hard that his forehead cracked against the deck. For a moment, he felt his limbs go uncontrollably limp, but he forced himself to pull his legs under him and once more rose to a crouch. The man on his back was trying to snake an arm around his neck. As Orlando fought to hold him off, a hand with a gun in it swung down close to his face. Orlando smashed at it with the axe and was rewarded with a howl of pain. The gun skittered away under the railing and into the water. He ducked his head, throwing the man on his back to the deck, 
then grabbed at the belt of the man he'd kneecapped a few moments before and tugged his pistol out of its, hol out of its holster. Shadows were all around him, closing in. The urge to start firing, to clear away these threatening figures, was very powerful, but they were so much more convincingly human than his usual foes that he found himself almost fatally reluctant. He tossed the gun down the ramp. Grab it, he gasped, hoping one of his companions would see it lying on the dark gangway. He didn't know if he'd been loud enough to be heard. His head was filling with echoes. Several more men seized the chance and grabbed at his legs and arms. Another fell on top of him, jabbing a knee into his back and closing strong fingers on his throat. Struggling, he managed to throw off a few of his attackers, but more crashed down on top of him in their place. He fought wildly to rise, but only managed to turn over, face to the sky as he sucked desperately for air. The lights in the barge's rigging stretched and wavered as the blackness in his head grew, as though they were stars sending their dying flare into the eternal night of space. It's funny, he thought. Stars, lights, none real, all real. Something was hammering on his head, a dull rhythmic thump that seemed to rattle his whole skull. Each pounding beat sent a splash of blackness through his thoughts, the tidal mark higher each time. He heard someone shouting, the woman, what was her name? It didn't matter. The breath, the life was being pressed out of him, and he was glad to let it go. He had been so tired, so very tired. He thought he heard Fredericks calling him, but he couldn't answer. That, at least, was a little sad. Fredericks would have loved the lights. Stars, they were, they were stars, weren't they? Would have loved how bravely they burned in the darkness. He would miss Fredericks. He was in a place, a between place, it seemed. A waiting place, maybe. He couldn't really think about the whole thing very well, and it didn't matter just now, anyway. He was lying down, he knew that, but he was also standing looking out across a great canyon. A massive slope of shiny blackness dropped sheerly away below him, its bottom edge invisible, <coughs> in a sea of swirling fog. On the far side of the canyon, dimly visible through the tendrils of my rising mist, was the Golden City. But somehow it was not the same city he had seen before. This city's buildings were taller and stranger than anything he could have imagined, and tiny radiant shapes flitted back and forth among the spiraling towers, brilliant specks of light that might have been fireflies or angels. It's another dream, he thought, and was startled to hear he had said it aloud. Surely he should not speak here. Someone was listening, he knew. Someone or something who was looking for him. Someone he did not want to meet. It's not a dream, a voice said in his ear. He looked around, startled. Sitting on a glossy outcrop of the smooth black substance was an insect the size of a small dog. It was made entirely of glittering silver wires, but was somehow completely alive. It's me, boss, it said. I've been trying to reach you for hours. I got you amplified all the way and I can barely hear you. What's? It was so hard to think. The cottony fog had somehow got inside his head as well. Where? Hurry up, boss. Tell me what you want. If anyone comes in and catches me sitting on your chest, they're going to throw me into the recycler. A thought small and fluttery as the distant lights moved through his mind. Beazle? Tell me, 
What's going on? He fought to remember. I'm... I'm trapped somewhere. I can't get out. I can't get back. Where, boss? He struggled against the waves of numbness, of darkness. The distant city was gone now, and the fog was rising. He was having trouble seeing even the insect, though it sat only an arm's length away. The place I was looking for? He wanted to remember a name, a man's name, something with an A. Atasco, he said. The effort was overwhelming. A moment later, the insect had faded. Orlando was left alone with the mist and the mountainside and the growing dark. Chapter 39, Blue Fire. This may take us a little past the top of the hour. We'll see. Anyway, I'm going to finish this chapter. So, NetFeed, Entertainment, Second Thoughts on Second Sight, Visual, Opening Montage from Here It Comes, Voiceover, Celebrity Psychic, Fozzie Robinette Murphy, host of the popular net show Second Sight, and Here It Comes, has announced that she is retiring because she has foreseen the end of the world. Visual. Murphy climbing into limousine. When asked how this differs from previous apocalypses she has predicted, Murphy was brief and to the point. Visual, Murphy at front gate of Gloucestershire home. Murphy, because this time it's really going to happen. The coastline, gliding past, thick jungle greenery and long rooted trees drinking at the edges of sandbars, was not entirely strange to her. Rini had seen places along the African coast that looked only a little different. What troubled her now, as she watched a flock of flamingos descending to a salt marsh, like an air squadron returning to base, their brilliant pinks dulled by twilight, was the knowledge that none of it was real. It's simply too much to accept. It's... It's seductive. That's what it is. She leaned over the rail. The fresh wind cooled all of her, but the parts of her face covered by her V-tank mask. Even this curious numbness, a kind of tactile blind spot, dead to the world she saw all around her, was beginning to recede as though her brain were beginning to fill in the experiences just as with a real ocular blind spot. At certain moments, she could swear she did feel the wind on her face. It was difficult not to admire the completeness of this dream, the incredible skill and effort that had gone into it. She had to remind herself that Atasco, the man who had caused this wonder to be built, was perhaps the best of other lands' feudal barons. He, arrogant and self-involved though he was, had at least had the basic humanity not to harm anyone in pursuit of his own satisfaction. The others, she thought of Stephen's beautiful brown legs atrophied, his arms now like slender sticks. She remembered Susan's shattered body. The others who had built this place were monsters. They were ogres living in castles built from the bones of their victims. I have a terrible confession, Rini. Kabu! You startled me. I am sorry. He clambered onto the railing beside her. Do you wish to hear my shameful thought? She put her hand on his shoulder. Resisting the impulse to pet him, she simply let it lie there in his thick fur. Of course. Since I first came to this place, I have been, of course, Worried for our safety and frightened of the larger evil that the man Sellers described, but almost as strong in me. All this time, there has been a great joy. Rini was suddenly unsure where this was going. Joy? He pivoted on his rear end and stretched a long arm toward the darkening coastline. A curiously unbaboon like gesture. Because I have seen now that I can make my dream real. 
whatever evil these people have done or intend to do. And my heart tells me it is a very great evil indeed. They have also caused an amazing thing to be created with such power. I think I could truly keep my people alive. Rainy nodded slowly. That's not a shameful thought, but this kind of power, when well, people who have something like this aren't going to give it away, they keep it for themselves, just like they always have. Kabu did not reply. As the last daylight vanished, they remained at the railing together, watching the river and the coast become one inseparable shadow beneath the stars. Sweet William appeared to be taking a perverse pleasure in his role. Just like Johnny, just like Johnny Ice Pick, me? He waved the gun menacingly at the captain and the God King's naval adjutant, the official who had met them at the gangway. The two cringed. It's not me normal line, dearies, but I could develop a taste for it. Rini wondered which scared the Tamalunis more, the gun or William's death clown appearance. How far are we from the end of the water, as you know? She asked the captain. He shook his head. He was a small man, beardless as all the others, but his face was covered with black tattoos, and he wore an impressively large stone lip plug. Over and over you ask that. There is no end. On the far side of these waters is the land of pale men. If we continue along the coast as we are doing, we will cross the Caribbean. Rini heard her translation software pause for a split instant before supplying the name. And come to the empire of the Mexica. There is no end. Rini sighed. If, as Atasco had said, there was a finite edge to the simulation, then the puppets themselves must not know it. Sorry, I just lost my place. Um, then the puppets themselves must not know it. Perhaps they simply ceased to be, then reappeared on their return voyage, filled with suitable memories. Of course, the same thing could be true for me. And how would I ever know? As difficult as it was to look at the coastline and believe it a purely digital reality, it was even harder to imagine the captain and the king's adjutant as artificial. A coastline, even one filled with exuberant vegetable life, could be created fractally, although this level of sophistication beggared anything she had ever seen. But people? How could even the most sophisticated programming, the most strenuously Evolutionary A-life environments create such diversity, such seeming authenticity. The captain had bad teeth, stained from chewing some leafy herb. He wore what was obviously a favored knick-knack, a fish vertebra, on a chain around his thick neck. The adjutant had a port wine birthmark just behind his ear and smelled of licorice water. Are you married? she asked the captain. He blinked. I was. Retired because she wanted me to. Stayed ashore for three years in Kibdo. Couldn't take it, so I re-enlisted. She left me. Rini shook her head. A sailor's tale, so common as to be almost a cliché, but by the slight bitterness in his voice, like scar tissue around an old wound, he clearly believed it. And every single person in this simulation, in all the unguessable number of simulations that made up this other land, would have his or her own tale. Each one would believe himself to be alive. And singular. It was too much to comprehend. Do you have any idea how to make the ship work? She asked Sweet William. Dead simple, really? He smiled lazily and stretched. Hidden bells jangled. It's got a, got a bit of a handle. Push, pull, forward, back. Could do it in me sleep. Then we will put these two and the rest of the crew overboard. She was startled by the adjutant's violent reaction for a moment, then realized the misunderstanding. In the lifeboats, there seem to be plenty. Aye, aye. 
William saluted jauntily. Whenever you are ready, Admiral. The bed in he who is favored above all others massive stateroom was of a size commensurate with celestial royalty. Martine and Orlando lay at either edge where they could be reached by those caring for them with a dozen foot expanse of silken sheets between them. Orlando was sleeping, but Rini didn't think it was a healthy sleep. The, the big man's breath rasped in and out through his gaping mouth and the muscles in his fingers and face twitched. She laid her palm against his broad forehead, but felt nothing any more unusual than the mere fact of virtual tactility. Kabu clambered up onto the bed and touched the man's face, but he seemed to have a different purpose in mind than Rini had, for he left his delicate simian hand there for a long time. He looks very sick, Rini said. He is. The slender man named Fredericks looked up from his seat by Orlando's side. He's real sick. What? What is it? Is it something he caught outside? In real life, I mean, or is it some effect from coming into the network? Frederick shook his head morosely. He's got something bad. In real life, it's a disease where you get old too soon. He told me the name, but... He told me the name, but I, 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 I forgot. He rubbed at his eyes. When he spoke again, his voice was faint. I think right now he's got pneumonia. He said he, he said he was dying. Rini stared at the sleeping man's almost cartoonish face, the square jaw and long black hair. Even after only a short acquaintance, the thought of his death was painful. She turned away, helpless and miserable. Too many victims, too many suffering innocents, not enough strength to save any of them. Con Lee, who had been holding Martine's hand, stood up as Rini walked around the perimeter of the huge bed. I wish there was something more I could do for your friend. She is a little, little quieter now. I thought of offering her some water. She trailed off. There was no need to finish. Martine, like everyone else, must be receiving nourishment and hydration in the real world. If not, nothing the Chinese woman or anyone else could do would help. Rini sat on the edge of the bed and wrapped her hand around Martine's. The French woman had not spoken a word all the way to the ship, and after Sweet William had snatched up the gun, which Orlando had tossed away, and pressed it against the adjutant's head to secure their passage on the barge, Martine had collapsed. Rini had carried her on board with Quan Lee's help. It had taken three of the sailors to carry bulky Orlando. But there, excuse me, but there was nothing else she could think of to do. Whatever was afflicting Martine was even more mysterious than the young man's ailment. We are going to have to put the, we're going to put the captain and crew into boats and set them free, Rini said after a while. Are there enough of us to run the ship? Quan Lee asked. William says it pretty much sails itself, but I suppose we need enough people to keep watch. Frowning, she thought for a moment. What did I say we were? Nine? She turned. Kabu was still crouched beside Orlando, his hands splayed on the big man's chest. His patience seemed to be resting a little more easily. Well... There's six of us here. There's William, although he almost counts for two. She smiled wearily for Quan Lee's benefit as much as her own. The robot man? What did he call himself? T4B or something? And the woman who went up the rigging to keep watch. Yes, nine. Besides, having a full crew would matter more if we had some idea where we are going. She broke off as she realized that the gentle pressure on her fingers was becoming stronger. Martine's eyes were open, but still unfixed. Brini, I'm here. We're on the ship. 
We are hoping to be out of this Temelun simulation soon. I'm... I'm blind, Rini. She forced the words out with great effort. I know, Martin. We'll do our best to find a way to... She was stopped by a very hard squeeze. No, you do not understand. I am blind. Not just here. I have been blind for a very long time. You mean in your real life? Martine nodded slowly. But I have... There are modifications on my system that allow me to read my way through the net. I see the data in my own way. She paused. Speaking was obviously difficult. In some ways, it has made me better at what I do than if I had sight. Do you understand? But now everything is very bad. Because of the information rate, like you said. Yes, I... Since I have come here, it is like people screaming in both... It is like people screaming in both my ears, like I am being blown in a great wind. I cannot, she brought trembling hands up to her face. I am going mad. Ah, oh, may the good Lord save me. I am going mad. Her face contorted, although no tears came to the sim eyes. Her shoulders began to shake. Rini could only hold her as she wept. Two large lifeboats held the ship's three dozen crew fairly comfortably. Rini stood on the deck, feeling the shudder of the engine beneath her feet, and watched the last sailor drop from the ladder into the boat, black pigtail flying. Are you sure you don't want another, another lifeboat? She called down to the captain. You'd be less crowded. He looked up at her, plainly unable to comprehend this kind of soft-hearted piracy. It is not far too sure. We will be fine. He mumbled his lip plug for a moment, contemplating an indiscretion. You know, the patrol boats have only remained at a distance to protect the lives of the crew. They will stop you and board you within minutes after we are safe. We're not worried. Rini tried to sound confident, but of all their company, only Kabu seemed truly calm. The small man had found a long piece of twine in the captain's cabin and was blithely constructing one of his intricate string figures. Like I said, got a couple of more pages. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit past the top of the hour, but it's almost done. Rini's intention to release the hostages before the ship reached the simulation's edge had been the subject of long discussion, but she had been adamant. She would not risk taking the Temeluni out of their world. Perhaps the other land machinery would not compensate for them in this peculiar circumstance, and they would then cease to exist. It would be no better than mass murder. The captain shrugged and sat down. He signaled to one of his men to start the engine. The boat glided forward and then began to pick up speed, chugging along after the adjutant's boat, which was already only a white dot against the darkness. A beam of light cut through the fog from the far side of the barge, flicking across the undraped mast. Well, there they are, Chuck, said William. He held up his confiscated pistol and looked at it sadly. This won't be much use against the Royal Featherhead Navy, now will it? More lights appeared, these fixed like low-slung low stars. Several large vessels were coming up fast behind them. One of them blew a long, deep note on a steam whistle, a sound that vibrated in Rini's bones. Kabu had put down his string. Perhaps we should consider... He never had a chance to finish his suggestion. Something whistled past them and splashed into the water off the bow. A moment later, a globe of fire bloomed in the deeps, fountaining the coastal waters and releasing a sullen thump as the sound reached the surface. They're shooting at us, shouted Fredericks from one of the hatchways. Rini was silently commending him for obviousness under combat conditions when she noticed that the exploding shell had left some kind of 
unexpected after-effect in the depths before them. The waters sparkled with glittering points of neon blue. Rini caught her breath. She struggled to remember the name of the robot goggle boy currently in the barge's wheelhouse, but could not. Tell, tell, what's his name? Full speed ahead, she screamed. I think we are there. Another shell arched overhead and slashed into the water, nearer this time. The impact made the barge rock so that Rini and William had to grab at the railing. Slowly, though, she could feel the ship picking up speed. She leaned over, squinting at the dark swells. Surely the sparkling blue light was brighter now? It looked like an entire school of some exotic bioluminescent fishes had surrounded the royal barge. Something exploded directly beneath them. The entire front end of the barge lifted up as though shoved from beneath by a giant hand. Rini fell to the deck and slid. The barge tipped sideways. Then, like a living creature, it seemed to find its center of balance and dropped back down into a trough between waves. The water rising around them seemed pulsingly alive with blue light. It was alive. It was electrically active, radiant, and throbbingly, brilliantly vital. All the sounds of sea and ship and exploding shells abruptly stopped. In perfect silence and an absolute blue glow, they passed through. Rini's first thought was that they were caught in the timeless instant of an explosion, struck in the dreary heart of a quantum event that would never end. The bright light, more white than blue now, dazzled her so that she had to shut her eyes against the pain. When she carefully opened them a moment later, the light was still there, but she realized it was only the brilliance of an ordinary daytime sky. They had left the night behind them in Temelun. Her second thought was that the last explosion had blown the entire top off the barge. They still bobbed on the water, and the coastline, now revealed in crystal clear daylight and full of startlingly huge trees as wide and tall as skyscrapers, was very visible. <coughs> but there was no longer a, tra a railing to look over. Rini realized that she was on her knees, clutching at something curving and fibrous and as thick as her arm that stretched where the railing had been. She dragged herself around so she could look back at where the rest of the barge had been, the wheelhouse, the royal apartment. Her companions were lying in the center of something that was large and flat, but otherwise nothing like a barge. Something ribbed and dimpled like a giant piece of modern sculpture, something that curled at the edges and is, was as stiffly yielding as crocodile hide beneath Rini's hand. Kabu, she said, are you all right? We have all survived. He still wore his baboon body. But we... Rini lost the rest of his sentence in a growing drone from somewhere above. She stared at the flat expanse upon which they all lay, at the almost ragged shape of its edges where they curled up from the water, and realized what the thing they were floating on looked like. Not a boat at all, but a, a leaf? The droning was growing louder and louder, making it hard to think. The huge trees on the distant shoreline, it made a sort of sense then. They, they were not a trick of distortion and distance, but was the place itself too large, or were she and her companions? The sound rattled in her ears. Rini looked up to see something the size of a single-engine airplane glide overhead, hover for a moment so that the wind almost knocked her flat, and then speed away again, wings glinting like stained glass in the bright, bright sun. It was a dragonfly. Jeremiah found him going through the cabinets in the kitchen for perhaps the dozenth time looking for something that both of them knew was not there. Mr. Sulawayo, 
Rini's father tugged open another door and began shoving industrial-sized cans and heat-sealed ration packs out of his way, working with ragged intensity. When he had cleared a hole, he reached in until his armpit was pressed into the front of the shelf and groped in the darkness at the back of the cabinet. Mr. Surueo, Joseph. He turned to stare at Jeremiah, his eyes red-rimmed. What you want? I want a little help. I've been sitting at the console for hours. If you'll take a turn, I can make us something to eat. Don't want nothing to eat. Long Joseph turned back to his search. After a moment, he cursed, retracted his arm, then began the same process on the next shelf down. You don't have to eat then, but I do. In any case, that's your daughter in that tank, not mine. A canister of soy meal tipped off the shelf and thumped onto the floor. Long Joseph continued to scrabble in the space at the back of the shelf. Don't you tell me about my daughter. I know who's in that tank. Jeremiah Daco made a noise of angry frustration and turned to go. He stopped in the doorway. I'm not going to sit there forever just staring at those screens. I can't. And when I fall asleep, nobody will be checking their heart rates. Nobody will be watching in case the tanks go wrong. God damn! A line of plastic sacks slid off the shelf and toppled. One broke, puffing a sulfurous spray of powdered egg across the cement floor. God damn this place! Long Joseph swept more sacks from the shelf and muscled a can up over his head and flung it down so hard it bounced before coming to rest against the rear wall. An ooze of syrup trickled from beneath the crumpled lead. What the hell kind of place is this? He shouted. How someone supposed to live like this? In some goddamn cave in the ground? Long Joseph lifted another can as though to throw it, and Jeremiah flinched, but instead he lowered it again, staring at it as though it had just been handed to him. Hand it as though it had just been handed to him by Let me start that one more time. Long Joseph lifted another can as though to throw it. Where did we go? Sorry, there it is. Okay, sorry. Just one page left. Long Joseph lifted another can as though to throw it, and Jeremiah flinched. But instead he lowered it again, staring at it, as though it had just been handed to him by a visitor from outer space. Look at this craziness, he said, holding it out for Jeremiah to examine. Jeremiah did not move. Look, it's a corn porridge. They got goddamn millipop in 10 gallon cans. Enough porridge to choke an elephant, but they don't got even one beer. He laughed harshly and dropped the can on the floor. It rolled ponderously against a cabinet door. Shit, I want a drink. I am so dry. Wide-eyed, Jeremiah shook his head. There's nothing here. I know that. I know. But, but sometimes a man just have to look. Long Joseph looked up from the mess on the floor. He seemed on the verge of tears. You say you want to go sleep. Go sleep. Show me what to do with that goddamn machine. That's all. Heartbeat and body temperature are really the important things. You can bring them out just by pushing this. It lifts the tank covers. But your daughter said not to do it unless they were really in trouble. Long Joseph stared at the two cable-draped dra sarcophagi, both now standing upright. I can't take this, he said at last. What do you mean? There was an edge of irritation in Jeremiah's voice. You said you'd watch for me. I am exhausted. The other man didn't seem to hear him. It's just, just like Stephen. Just like my boy. She right there, but I can't touch her. Can't help her. Can't do anything. He scowled. She right there, but I can't do anything. Jeremiah stared at him for a moment. His face softened. He put his hand gently on Long Joseph's shoulder. Your daughter is trying to help. She's very brave. 
Joseph Sulawayo shrugged the hand away, his eyes fixed on the tanks as though he could see through the dense vibramic shells. She won damn fool what she is. She think just because she go to the university, she know everything. But I tried to tell her these want people to mess about with. She wouldn't listen. None of them listen. They never do. His face suddenly crumpled, and he blinked at tears. All the children gone. All the children gone away. Jeremiah started to reach out again, then pulled back his hand. After a long silence, he turned and made his way to the elevator, leaving the other man alone with the silent tanks and bright screens. And that's the end of the first volume. And with that, oh, we did go way past, didn't we? Um, anyway, thank you so, so, so very much. Um, lovely to have you with me, not just tonight, but for the whole of City of Golden Shadow. That was great fun. I will be back tomorrow night at 7 p.m., um, my time to read whatever I read, and I have no idea yet what that's going to be, but I will have at least that one night. And then as far as what's going to happen next week, please check in on my social media pages, especially on Facebook. Um, and I will let people know I'm in flux. I may, it's quite likely I might take the weekend off while I start thinking about what to do next. Uh, I'm not gonna disappear. There will still be readings ahead and, uh, or, or there will be things similar to readings, maybe, you know, little dance studio stuff, uh, who knows, maybe fireworks, um, maybe uh, Manny Petty, you know, who knows what might happen. But anyway, uh, what will happen is something. Um, and in the interim, while I figure out what's going to happen next, thank you so much for spending time with me. Keep being good, taking good care of those uh, around you, your loved ones, but also your friends and neighbors. And um, you you mean a lot to me. So you're taking care of me just by showing up and hanging out. And I thank you so much um, for spending time with me, as I said. So anyway, be good. Peace. And I'll see you real soon. <laughs>